All right, everyone, precious brothers and sisters, been a long day, but I want to come on here. I've been very busy today uh, with the ministry, but I want to touch on a very important topic. I'm going to give a very important teaching. I'm going to make it as quick and painless as I possibly can. It's not going to set well. The truth never does set well with uh, many people today, many brothers and sisters. But so be it, the truth will be told. Now, this is going to be on the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the gift of tongues and prophesy, the gift of laying on of hands. Now, I did a four-part series, uh, and I titled it um, Blood, Fire, and Pillars of Smoke, False Prophecies. And we're talking about so many people hearing a word from God. I, I had a word from the Lord today, and three or four times a day, every day of the week and they have the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So I want to clear the air on this. We're going to touch on because it's, we've been getting into some pretty good conversation. Uh, and the last couple of videos regarding the issue of speaking in tongues. So let's uh, touch on this and touch on the gift of prophecy. Now as we know, just go back and watch. Um, I already did a teaching on this. Uh, Acts 1 and 2, when uh, in the upper room at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit poured out on the disciples, now a cloven tongue, uh, like fire, sat on each one of the disciples, and they began to speak in another tongue. Now, at the time, there were a lot of people gathered from all around the earth, all around the world, from various places. And they heard each one of them, the disciples, speaking in their own language of the place where they were born. Now this was uh, not an angelic uh, language of the angels, so to speak. It was an actual foreign language that was foreign to them, but not to the ones that heard them speaking in their own language. Now many will say, no, uh, it's the language of the angels. The angels spoke in tongues. Now. What I want to make mention, we're going to cover this real quick, then I'm going to take you to uh, some scripture and so, so on. Now, I want you to think back at the time when the disciples were there and Jesus ascended, was met uh, by a cloud and taken up. There were two men dressed in white. Now, these were angels. Now, can you imagine if these uh, angels went to the disciples and rather than say, why is it you seek? this Jesus that has just went up in the cloud. What if they would have spoke in uh, The disciples wouldn't have had an idea or a clue what they spoke. I'm just trying to uh, use this as an example. Angels are messengers. They speak in tongues. They speak in every known language uh, under the heavens and in the heavens. What would have happened when these angels, messengers, would have went to uh, warn Lot uh, of what was to come, the fire and the brimstone, if they didn't speak Lot's language and Lot couldn't understand them? You see my point that I'm trying to make? Now, speaking in tongues, uh, we're gonna, let, let's, let me take you to a few things here I think you'll find interesting. And then we're going to talk a little bit, if we have time, about the gift of prophecy. Boy, I've been under the weather. and uh, But do you understand what I'm saying now? The Holy Spirit poured out in the upper room uh, at Pentecost on the disciples and only on the disciples. They were given this gift of speaking in tongues, in a foreign tongue where people from whatever area, whatever country could hear and could understand. Uh, they could interpret what these disciples were saying. They, they couldn't understand how they knew their own language. Now what Yeshua did is he told them that the Holy Spirit would pour out on them that John baptized with water. I come to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. This was done in a foreign, known language, a foreign language, not gibberish, so the gospel, listen to me, so the gospel of Jesus Christ, Yeshua, could be spread around the world. That was the original 
intent. All right, let me take you to a few things. And it's not to discredit anyone. If you want to speak in a, a language that's not known by anyone on this planet, uh, that's going to have to be your choice. I'm not here to tell you what to do. I'm just going to bring you the truth. And then you decide. You've got, you've got to go to Scripture. Now, a thorough study of biblical tongues reveals that tongues were given as a sign not to the believer but to the unbelieving Jews because Jews require do you read your Bible do you read your scripture Jews have always required a sign and Greeks uh, seek after wisdom that's in we can find this and we give you reference in 1st Corinthians uh, chapter 1 22 the Jews always required a sign to prove that God was involved in a work. Think of Moses. All right, it was not for the believer. It was for the unbeliever originally. For the Jews, it was a foreign language so the gospel could be spread throughout the world. At the time of the early church, let me give you a little more examples. Tongues were not a sign for believers but for unbelievers first corinthians 14 22 why then is gibberish spoken today as tongues a language that is not known by anyone when only believers are present so why when you're in a church filled with believers and the pastor is up there and he's preaching a sermon and it's getting to the key points and it may be touching an area or an aspect of your life speaking in tongues was for the non-believer so right as he's hitting the key point that might change your life or a non-believer that might just now really truly have the Holy Spirit upon them and want to just raise their hand and uh, cry out for Jesus to save them then we've got sister Mary over here she just starts speaking in tongues this gibberish language and all attention all heads turn to her she may get up and she may run down the aisle and start uh, shaking and thrashing as she's speaking in this tongue the sermon got lost uh, the key point now uh, is over with the person that was going to be uh, called upon Jesus to come into their heart now is looking at this person speaking in this language and probably you know and I have to be honest a lot of people just don't understand that and it scares them away when it is not to edify the church this is to edify you if you want to have your alone time when you're alone in your prayer closet that to edify yourself that's between you and God but it's not to edify the church and the Apostle Paul knew this that's why he told them at Corinth I would rather that you would uh, prophesy than to speak in tongues. All right, let's continue on just a little bit. Tongues were languages. They were actual languages. And this is found in Acts 2, uh, verse 8. It was not a form of gibberish. On the day of Pentecost, tongues were understood by men from around the known world. And that's proven. I've proven that to you in Acts 2. 9 through 11. Tongues in the Corinthian church were being used improperly because that body of believers were carnal and ungodly in their practices. In fact, Paul had to write two books to correct them and to teach them these were not Christians that were to serve as godly examples to us in the use of spiritual gifts. And I want to make mention not everyone who is baptized in the Holy Spirit are going to have all the gifts tongues you're we're going to find out and it's not a form of gibberish or we already spoke about it the angelic voice of the angels the angels can speak in all known languages or else how could they have spoke to lot to warn lot and and they're, they're messengers how can they get their message across if no one can understand what they were saying tongues are not mentioned after the book of Corinthians in the latter epistles because by the end of the apostolic era tongues were no longer needed as a sign gift first Corinthians for your reference uh, verse 13 8 
They were not mentioned after Corinthians because by the end of the apostolic era, tongues were no longer needed as a sign gift. This comes from the uh, 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 Holiness uh, Movement, the Pentecostal Movement, Assemblies of God. Actually, um, I don't know if we'll touch on this, Paul, the Apostle Paul, a lot of women speak in this, what they call tongue, but it's a gibberish. And Paul um, states that uh, he desires women not to speak in tongues. Yet they do, and they are a big part of the uh, movement, of the Pentecostal movement. Tongues have only resurfaced since 1901, and not biblical tongues at that. What gibberish have you looked into the history of Pentecostalism? Agnes Osman, uh, Parham, Seymour, Bartleman, etc. I had always trusted those who taught me the history from a Pentecostal perspective. Most teachers avoided the real history, but the facts do not support Pentecostal claims that scriptural practices were being taught, or that the people who founded the Pentecostal movement were even godly at all. Moreover, Consider the involvement of women in the tongues movement from Agnes Osmond to contemporary female preachers. God's word forbids women to teach or to have authority over men, but the tongues movement is predominantly female driven. Women were not allowed to speak in tongues in the church. First Corinthians. Women were not allowed, permitted whatsoever to speak in tongues in the church. Are we going to follow the living word, the teachings of the disciples, the apostles, the apostle Paul? Are we going to follow man? 1 Corinthians 14, 34. Again, I'm not judging you. I'm not trying to um, make you see the light, so to speak, and to listen to every word that I'm telling you. I want you to take this, and I want you to play this back and just take this to your father in heaven. Don't take it to church. Don't take it to organized religion. Take it to your father. Take it to his house for discernment. No more than three men were allowed to speak in tongues in the assembly. And then only one at a time. Not like the mass confusion that is taught and occurs in churches today. With gibberish. 1 Corinthians 14 27-33 Tongues today, since 1901, are not biblical tongues and have almost always been associated with other unscriptural phenomena like slain in the spirit that are prevalent in pagan and eastern religions. Now my wife can tell you, I wish she would come on the camera here, she's in the next room. We went to a church, and it was last year, where they were speaking in this gibberish, and you know, I, I, I don't go to organize religion, 501c3 churches, but I just, I went with my wife. My wife was pretty upset, as was I. I'm, an, I'm you can't tell from the, the camera here, but I'm not a small guy, and no one is going to knock me over. The Holy Spirit's going to slay me. It's going to be the Holy Spirit. The preacher up there was physically pushing my wife over and off balance. She wasn't being slain by the Holy Spirit. Some people were falling over. It's kind of like mass hysteria. When she got to me, you know, um, I've been around a lot, a lot of training in uh, self-defense, and uh, uh, I'm not going to fall over if I don't want to fall over. She was pushing me. She did everything but sweep my leg out, and I would not go down. This is, not you know, and this is what's running rampant in the Pentecostal, and it was a Pentecostal church, and this is what's happening uh, in the churches today. When... You are in the house of God, and you are giving praise and worship. And there's a, a key sermon. And you've got the women and the men in the congregation right in the middle. Uh, rather than edifying the church, they start blurting out in this tongues and all attention. The whole focus of the teaching is lost, and all attention is drawn on the person speaking in this gibberish, getting up, running, shaking violently uh, to where we don't even know the message. What was the message? What was the sermon? Because all attention uh, was drawn away from the word of God. And you can't tell me that that is of God. Who would like to draw all the attention away from the lesson 
the teaching, the inspiration, the inspirational word of God. Uh, the devil sure would. The spirits of the prophets are always subject to the prophets when we pray. We are always to be in control of ourselves. God is a God of order, not of confusion. Uh, conversely, the Pentecostal services now that I have attended have embraced wild, radical confusion. People running around the sanctuary at full speed. People shaking their heads uncontrollably as if possessed. And it often has made me wonder. And they probably are possessed. People shaking their heads uncontrollably. Controllably. People uh, bending in apparent agony, falling uh, immodestly. And uh, women laying on the floor and they have to have a blanket and cover them up with a blanket really quick. Uh, and uh, there is so much more. I, I, I'm going to cut it right here. If we need be, we will come back uh, again. Now the prophecies that we see today uh, are not, are they edifying the church? We have, I've had a word from the Lord, I've, I, uh, the Lord spoke to me, he given me this prophecy, and these prophecies are not coming true. We're losing track. The church today is losing focus. Now going back to the Pentecostal movement, and, and uh, this is what led to the charismatic Christian movement where this uh, imitator of the Holy Spirit, there's nothing holy about this snake spirit uh, whatsoever. That, um, it happened in the 19, uh, began in Montreal, I believe in the 1990s. Now, I have actually seen a video. I have watched a film clip of two people in a congregation the one was speaking in tongues, telling a joke. The other person was laughing. They were telling jokes back and forth, but in this gibberish. Uh, wake up, church. Wake up. I just want to bring you the truth. And um, if need be, we will continue. Let's see the comments. God bless you.